preparing and we are live live from all the way around the world uh, i love being able to do li lives with people who are in working remotely and uh, remotely and i'm super excited folks everybody at the elephant castle to talk to eric borgar borgar Bor borgo um, um <laughs> and the, the founder isn't it funny we, we go to your name um as a french canadian i should know it so many times over but i apologize but um, Eric, who is the founder of DigiPause, which is um, you know uh, an amazing platform that helps people create a more healthy relationship with their laptops and their devices, and we're going to get into all of that. And um, and as you talk about Eric, really kind of like looking into kind of like the you know the hows and the whys of why we need to create you know healthier relationships with our devices. Um, so it's, this has been a talk that, again, everybody knows that it's been put off because I've been in hospital for a little bit, um, and I'm glad to be out. I'm glad to be talking to you. You're coming to us from beautiful, sunny northern Lisbon, right, in Spain, kind of more yeah, into the interior? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's one hour up north from uh, Lisbon, Nick. Yeah, beautiful. Well, Eric, please pronounce your name correctly so everybody can know and introduce yourself to the, to the community. Let's do that. First and foremost, I want to say thank you, Nick. Thanks for your amazing contribution on this planet. Thanks for bringing this tribe alive. We need it so much. And uh, as we said before, directly or indirectly, and I'd like to start with that, the opposite of addiction is? Connection. connection. You got yes. it. So here I am, Eric Borgo, uh, Borgo from Canada, currently in Portugal. Pretty hot here at the moment. Um, and yes, the reason why I'm here for is really to uh, find ways to propose this uh, new idea of a wellness by design where it is needed most. And in this case, it's where people go to rest and reset hotels. So we'll, we'll talk about it more in details. Uh, it's difficult for me to give myself a title, to be honest with you. I, I prefer people to discover who I am out of my story and decide on their own what they see me in the big picture. Some people mm -hmm. call me a guide, sometimes I call myself a coach, but overall I think it's just titles. Uh, my passion, what's driving me uh, to do this work is this, this, this uh, intention to bring this notion of connectivity where it's needed most. And past the hotels, it's also around in communities. And again, it's something we can talk about later on in this conversation. Yeah. Well, you know, in your in your bio, you talk about your relationship with devices from about 20 years ago. I know that's when the digital revolution really began. So can you kind of describe what, what your life was like back then, 20 years ago, the, the, the beginning of the internet? You know, what was Eric's life like? And, and then how did, I suppose that we'll get the next question into where were you feeling disconnected? Because I want to go deeper into that. But what, let, let's describe your life 20 years ago when this kind of like, Younger Eric, the rise of the digital, the internet, you know, what were your feelings? What, how did you embrace the, the, the new digital revolution that was about to hit you? Yeah, well, you see, for people like us, Generation X, um, we saw the passage coming from this television that was already very addictive to computers. Hmm. What I found was the opposite from a machine that command what you're supposed to, uh, to, to view to another machine where you have the control, right? Steve Jobs said it so many times when he did public presentations around this new technology that was going to create this I culture. And I got into it right away. When mm -hmm. I said, wow, you mean that every time that I feel a, a sense of emptiness, I can fill it up with, with something? And this something became hours and hours and hours of uh, uh, online content that I was yeah. using as a form of distraction, but also because I was feeling empty mm. and meaningless in, in, this, in this world. Uh, just to give you an idea, um, 20 years ago-ish, I uh, joined the, the force, the Canadian force, because I was so much looking for community. Mm. I was like, I'm gonna go there, I'm gonna challenge myself, it's gonna be like a nice family, my dad was in the force, my brother's still in the force. So I was like, that is the solution. You know, you watch the videos and it feels like, wow, now I belong to a group of people. Mm -hmm. But years went by and from one addiction to an addiction, 
I realized that it was not for me. So it's around 2000 that I had my first uh, spiritual crisis. And I was like, who am I? Why am I here for? And I first uh, was introduced to First Nation because you live in Canada, you know what I'm talking about. And, and I was told about this relation, this necessity to reconnect with the land, the creator. Mm. And that's how I started, slowly but surely, to reveal myself to the world, taking off one mask after the other, you know, because that's what I was doing. I was just, I was unable to know who I was. And uh, for the years after, I joined the circus. And I thought that the circus was, and it still was the vision, a, long, a, a lifelong vision for me. It was like, I love these guys. I love mm -hmm. the spirit they bring into the world. I love the, the fact that we're always traveling together. We live like a family. I found my family. But here's what happened. At the beginning of the tech boom, one of the producers, producers said, Eric, instead of working with us, because it was very, it's very, um, it, it's very expensive to get some people on the road mm -hmm. when you travel. So they said, why you don't go back home, Quebec, and work from a distance? Now we can do it. We have access to the technology. Mm -hmm. Never they could imagine how much of a breakdown it would be for me. Because they were still working with, with them, but from a distance. So it was a different dynamic. It was not the same at all. And, um, and then years went by, and I saw how this addiction became a kind of a lifesaver. Because I was so unhappy. I was living in big cities. Uh, I was uh, able later after to um, work in the show business, because I've done many things, right? In the circus, I was promoting the circus. I was at some point a ringmaster, believe it or not. I was even teaching kids in schools, but I was not touring with these guys. I was working from a distance. And um, I never realized the impact of this disconnection in my life, Nick. I never did. And it took me years of, of very intense, uh, addictive, um, how do I say that? Uh, it's an addictive pattern, you know? And my drug of choice, I'm very honest here because we're very transparent, uh, was porn. Because my relationship with women was so-so. I was very uncomfortable in the presence of, uh, of women, especially when they were very nice. Mm. So instead of uh, trying to challenge myself in the real world, I chose to use the virtual one to compensate this lack of connection. We always go back to the same thing, connection, connection, connection. And when I talk to people who also share a similar type of journey, it's always back to the same idea. I was unable to relate to uh, my siblings or unable to connect with my community. So we're always trying to do that. You know? And I say we, because I think it's, just not, it's not just me here who, strugg who, who struggled before, who struggled with that uh, at the moment, right? Yeah. So many people are there who are yeah. struggling with uh, online addiction. Yeah, and especially because, and I think this is a bit that I'll, I'll start to ask you more about is is how online how online platforms are actually designed, you know, to create huge endorphin hits in in you know even the young children that use them today, right up to you know people our age where, you know, you get that little red bell twinkling on your on your yeah. Facebook feed and oh I need to see it and you know how the very little bits that I know about how. Facebook and Instagram and Twitter have been designed, which is, you know, to create these endorphin hits and to actually pull you in and to keep you there. So we can get more into that about, you know, the, these are the kind of some of the, the safety things that people need to be aware of. But it's really interesting that I thought to myself that in a time, especially now over the last, you know, three years, many people have been not forced, but given, I suppose, yeah, no, we were, we were forced to work from home you know, by mandate. So we were forced to leave the community of the office or the community of the sports club or the community of the education system to, you know, in many cases work from the, the room where you sleep in, you know, in, if you, in, in small flats in London where people are, are putting on their filters, they're putting on their brave faces, they're wearing their nice shirt, even though they might be wearing shorts underneath the table or while they perch themselves on a bed and, and they do their best to show up and work. 
and it's something that everybody has got has gone through a lot of people have gone through it's something that was your experience when you were you know asked to start working remotely 20 years ago and i'm wondering that you know many people are asked to do it but only a certain percentage of them will end up developing a a, a really unhealthy with relationship with their devices or you know, let's say with, uh, with, with, with drugs or with alcohol or, you know, with other kinds of things. Um, and it reminds me of the stories of, that I've read in, in books like from Sebastian Younger, you know, Tribes. Oh, my favorite. I'm my favorite. You, I love this book. Yeah. So when, when, when yeah, Sebastian Younger, Tribes, and it's Younger with a J. And, um, you know, he talks about the, the, the army, the vets in the army in, in the Vietnam, Vietnam War who, you know, many were exposed to, you know, highly addictive substances like heroin and like the majority of them. But when they came back into society and they had their families, they had jobs to go back to, you know, not everybody became an addict, but roughly around 10 percent did. And it was, um, you know, you talked about Johan Hari, you know, and, and the opposite of addiction is connection. And I suppose it was because a lot of people were exposed to disconnection in their life. They've lost their tribe of men who they were literally dying with in the jungles to coming back into a world where maybe they didn't have family, they had no checks and balances. And of course, you know, it was easy to escape with, 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 a, with a form of addiction and substance use. And, um, but it, it thinks too, like not, that not all of those people became addicted because there was no trauma in their life. And, and they found that most of the people that came back, something had happened in their lives normally around the youth and and another man that i'll quote is um gabor mate um and and gabor mate says that not everybody who has a trauma when they're young becomes an addict or an alcoholic but all alcoholics and addicts have had some kind of trauma in my life so i'm going to get a little bit kind of ask you you know a little bit deeper is that you know pre 50 30 year old eric you know, what, were there any instances in your life that you can remember growing up that, oh, that made you feel, feel very scared or that made you feel very disconnected? And could, but could that, that been the, 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 the root cause of some of the addictions that manifested themselves maybe a, a couple of decades later? Well, yes. Um, ah, yeah. yeah. Um, hmm. I've been through a series of traumas in my life. Yeah. And you please, you do not need to disclose anything like, oh, you, you know, no. uh, that you're not comfortable. I've been through a series of traumas and I've, I've been bullied also. And, you know, and my share of, uh, of life experience hmm. in the past. Um, and of course, that itself uh, kind of contributed directly or indirectly uh, to create this kind of very strong addictive personality of mine. With that being said, over the years, I realized the necessity to let go of the story. I've worked with different you know, therapists. I've done many programs in the past. And I realized that, hold on, if I always uh, relate to this story, never that I will create a new one. Mm -hmm. The past, you nurture the past story. So I work with addicts in there also, just that you know. And at the beginning of my journey, in 2008, because I was looking for a solution to mm. recover from online addiction. And all doctors and all therapists that I met said, sorry, there's nothing for you because it is not recognized yet as an issue. Now, remember, mm. 2008, okay? So what was I supposed to do? So, of course, I went out to find my answers. And what I discovered is this. Even if you have a load of trauma, even if you went through the worst experience in life ever, it's up to you to decide how you're going to make the shift and when you're going to make the shift. Now, of course, in the um, community of addict, it's often something that is a bit touchy-feely because, you know, we all have a story, don't we? And for years, I was in groups where I learned how to create my story uh, embellish my stories and be my story mm -hmm. and one day someone said just drop it how can you be a better version of yourself if you're so convinced about your story mm -hmm. so sometimes when I talk about my past I'm a bit vague because I'm like yeah okay this is like an identity 
but it's not me because I kind of left that aside. And I'm so grateful. You see, when I say that, often people get, get offended. I say, I'm very grateful that I had to go to physical and sexual abuse, but I feel very grateful that I've been bullied for years, grateful that I wasted years uh, consuming myself online. I am grateful because it, it gave me the, the strength. It gave me the core values for who I am today, right? Mm -hmm. It's, oh, a, it's I, a different I, approach to yeah. addiction and mental health, of course. I think there's that balance between saying, you know, like, um, am I my story or am I some of the experience? Am I, am I a sum of my experiences to be the man that I am today, to use those stories and experiences to create a pathway to help build trust with other individuals who maybe have gone through other things. So, you know, I always, I have no problem saying that, you know, I'm Nick and I'm an alcoholic and people are like, but you don't, you haven't had a drink in over six years. And, uh, you know, you you're you're attaching too much ownership around the word alcoholic but it's like but i am one you know i can never ever consume alcohol safely i know what the definition of the alcoholic is i'm not ashamed of the fact that i'm not designed to drink alcohol i actually have found it as being my purpose i people say uh, oh as an alcoholic you can't drink i say as an alcoholic i'm not meant to drink you know, that's, you know, I believe there was a purpose in, in society for people who remained and always were sober um, it, through my study of the evolution of tribes and anthropology and how people had roles in tribes. And I think that there was the 10% of people who were not meant to take mind altering substances. And that puts me really at peace. I, I think it's a bit of a theory, Eric. I don't, I can't quite prove it yet, but I would love to be able to do more research on that. But, um, you know, so so I think that it's for me, although I do not drink, you know, I know that I am not meant to drink. And if that is the word that society uses as an alcoholic, then I am one. And, you know, and that's so I think the other thing is that everyone has these images of what addicts and alcoholics yeah. are. And I think we could get more into that and in that your experience of working with people who have had challenges working with digital devices and being online. I imagine you work with people who people would be like, that person does not have a problem. They've got all their stuff together, you know, you know, but, but obviously they, they've come to you for a reason. So I think that for, I think the human ego is designed to think that there's nothing wrong with us. I can't portray to the world that I have, I've got an issue with substance or with, with, with drugs or, or with, with, with my laptop. Um, and I think that that's the most beautiful thing about any kind of first step. Anything is admitting that you've got some kind of problem. Yeah. The so, first step. yeah. So how, how is it that you, you know, how do people find you with their relationships with, with their phone and with, um, uh, with their laptops, with their online world, I suppose, you know, what is it, what's the process I suppose that you go through with that, their kind of step one ish version of they have a problem with with their their online uh, relationships. Well, um, in respect to um, to what you said earlier, uh, and in reference to all the movement, including the Alcoholic Anonymous, uh, what I created is a slightly similar version, uh, except that I don't. Um, I don't really, uh, I can know, put it together the same way. In other mm -hmm. words, the only way that someone can understand the value to reconnect is to know that, that whoever is to know that they are disconnected. Yes. And I am not, that's why I say it's hard for me to give titles because I use nature, right? Mm -hmm. My job is just to bring people back to the source of the healing power. It's not Eric, it's not Nick, it's nature. Mm -hmm. We lost that, we're disconnected. Then after, only then can they reconnect with their true nature. That's why I saw amazing results in my life. And every time that I work with people, I say, are you ready? Are you up for change? Yeah, okay. I will respect where you're coming from, respect your system of values, respect your tradition, whatever, okay? So let's go in a place where there is no ego involved. There is no agenda. There is no, uh, you got to be better. Who cares? Nature. Nature will take you just the way you are. Mm -hmm. So if someone say to me, I can, I can hardly um, 
focus because I'm always on my phone. Nick, I'm not going to say, well, you have to do this, 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 and that. Chances are the person will do the opposite, mm. right? Because there's a payoff. Remember, this substitute serve a purpose. Yes. If you feel a sense of emptiness, you have to fill it up with something. And every time you get the hit, the like, whoa, I need more of it. And the difference between that and any chemical substance abuse, if you use any, any, anything from alcohol or cocaine or whatso, eventually it shows. It you know, mm. shows in your in your wallet. It shows in your it shows in your health. No, I mean, seriously. Yeah. yeah. You, can be, you cannot lie about it. You cannot say, oh, I'm okay. I, I, I'm fine. It shows. But yeah. someone can be watching porn on their phone all day. I've seen men, okay? I, I have all sorts of clients. But I mean, I'm talking about people that have a situation here. They don't look like, they, they, they look, you know, they put the suit on, they look good, yeah. they have their social mask, they're smiley all day, but inside they feel like a wreck. The reason mm-hmm. is nobody knows what's happening on their screen. They see the busy people, sure, but nobody knows what's, what's, what's happening here. And mm-hmm. nobody keeps them accountable from the mm-hmm. kind of content they're using, mm-hmm. okay? So the reason I say that is even if I argue and explain that it's better if you put it down, uh, let me give it to you again, the, the, the final the, the, the steps. Do not take your phone with you when you go to bed. Make sure that you install a system so at 10 o'clock at night, your phone is off. And I mean, I can go on. There's a list like that. We all know it, okay? But how often people do it for a few days and then they change their mind. They're like, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to change 10 o'clock, uh, 11 o'clock, uh, midnight. Uh, oh, forget it. It's easy because yeah. we control. But if instead I say to someone, you know what? Let's not argue. Let's put it aside. Switch it off as I did for the last seven days. Remember, put it aside. And then use, use your observation and turn it into something that will nourish you instead. Mm. That is depleting you. Okay. So what I do is to help people withdraw their unhealthy uh, distraction and turn them into healthier ones. Change from one addiction to another. And that you have probably heard the, heard the same lines from many uh, psycho, psychotherapists or psychiatrists that say, the only way that you can uh, cope with an addiction is if you create another one. For oh, me, I, I, exactly. yeah. yeah. I love to ride bicycle. Mm. I love cycling good for my health well guess what when i'm on my bicycle i'm not on my computer yeah so some people can say wait a minute that's a bit of an addiction here you're always on your bicycle yeah but fair enough if i just wait and cross my arms i'm like okay it's been two days uh gonna be another six four four or five or six days with no phone and you're like what am i gonna do with my life no it's time now now you can do something with your life you see yeah that, yeah. That's my approach, Nick. When people ask, yeah. how do you work? I'm very cold turkey. Let's yeah. not argue with it. Let's put it aside. And let's see what we can create while we have, while I have your attention and you have all the energy, the capacity to get where, where you need to be to get yeah. the healing needed to become what you want to become. You, you know, I, I love all of that. And I, especially the beginning <laughs> when you're like, you know what, it's Nick, we like the solutions are not like it's not like people just go oh i'm going to come up with this the solutions are there you know the solution is exactly what you said which is like a connection back to like lady gaia you know mama earth um you know source where we all come from and we yeah yeah, we we live in a world that that kind of poo-poos and shuns that as woo-woo talk and yoga talk and it's, it's like kind of frowned upon, especially in sports culture and in the corporate world. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. But then, you know, here's the one thing is that I was talking to a client a couple, about a year ago and they were like, Nick, you know, we need, we need you to help us make uh, all of our guys going into the fourth quarter of the financial year into Tom Brady's, you know? And I was like, Tom Brady is like a, a magnificent freak of a man who's like revolutionized quarterback positions the greatest of all time whatever you want to call him and it's like these things of this kind of like i want to make these the my my corporate world like like these high and probably one of the better best athletes of all time and then i was like well you know you can't do that 
but then I was this I was watching a Tom Brady documentary series and and he in it for the first time and I didn't know this reflected upon a trainer that he had who has um, you know some um, background in in uh, Asian and ancient medicines spirituality connection to the earth connection to the universe and I was like oh okay now I can help you make your guys into Tom Brady but we're going to be doing some things that are a little bit different we're not going to be these normal kind of leadership workshops we're going to actually be talking about connection back to the earth and meditation things like Phil Jackson was doing you know with the the 98 well the early 90s and mid 90s uh, Chicago Bulls you know with Dennis Rodman and the practicing of North American indigenous cultures and um, and and everything within the Chicago Bulls and you look you look at what Tom Brady has done you look at what Phil Jackson did with the Bulls and they went outside of the box and I love that what you're doing is saying hey this is here this is now this is what we've got and I'm just going to kind of leave this on another little story about how disconnected humanity has come from like the earth. As I was listening to a Joe Rogan podcast and he was describing the exact same thing that we're talking about is that how humanity, especially people, like I live right in the heart of London in Soho, and how people have become so disconnected from, from nature in that there was a power outage in LA. And he said mm. that the nine over there, 911, the 911 switchboard went off the hook because people were phoning, thinking that the earth was going to collide with the moon because they'd never seen the stars and the moon before. So they were like looking up at the star going, oh my gosh, there's going to, this is Armageddon. We're going to crash into the moon. Yeah. You know, so I'm sorry. That's just like a little bit of an interesting no, story and really anecdote to go on. Is that, you know, the, the snake, the, I saw some because yeah. most people can, can see it in their own life uh, while we're seeing that. Just remember what happened with Facebook. Was it yeah. last year? I yeah, it went down. Lisbon. I yeah. was in Lisbon, and eventually I saw people, I was in the hotel, I saw people walking around back and forth, like, oh my gosh. And I was like, what's going on? Is it another lockdown? What happened? Because someone died? Then I went down to the, to the cafe, and I, I don't have my phone with me. And people are like, huh? And I'm like, I got to ask someone, what's the tragedy today? It's like, everyone is on a panic mode. And then someone said, Facebook is down. I'm like, that's it? I was like, wow, that's how far we're, we're, we are. That's like, I was like, I don't even know what to explain. I was like, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, you see, I, I need to mention something in this uh, interview with you today. I found it very difficult, you know, because I've done a few podcasts and I've tried to create some programs online. But man, that it's difficult. If you're not on the court, how the heck are you supposed to pretend to be a player and be in mm. a team and do something concrete? No. So I think that's the biggest challenge that we have right now is to admit that we went that far, that this technology was there to serve us. I'm fine with that. But now we have to question who's using who. And mm. the reason I say that is that there is, I mean, how many coaches do you know on your side, right? I mean, the whole mark, online market is flooded with coaches, mm. coaches for what? Coaches for, I don't know, nutrition. Uh, there's so many coaches. Yeah. But what I found is for me, why I shine and stand apart, and it's not my ego who's talking, it's just because I know I've seen it many times, is when I'm with people. When I'm with people, I can shut my big mouth and just hold space, not mm. even say it. And then things happen, the momentum, the, 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 the everything, you know, you've been working just like me, we've been working out there. And I cannot reproduce that. I'm sorry, I cannot reproduce that on the screen. Yeah. It's so demanding for me when I'm facing 500 people in a room and I don't have a script and I know I need to go out there and create something. It's clean, it's, as we say, impeccable. When it comes out mm -hmm. of my mouth, the position, who I'm talking to, the connections, wow. But when I do this kind of intervention like we're doing now, which means that we're, we're, we're both from a distance, it's often vague, or I found it to be very uh, in a box. Yeah. And I'm yeah. Like, so my, mm -hmm. my intuitive side is not really, um, my intuitive side is a bit like off, I would mm -hmm. say. 
Yeah. So I don't know if people who are listening to us uh, ever had this kind of experience because we have lots of lefty out there and yeah. I spoke to some of them uh, already and they're like, how am I supposed to express myself on this thing? You know, it's, it's yeah. very challenging, I would say. It is very challenging, and it was one of the. It's one of the things as you speak. I, I I see. Yes, we have technology. Let's embrace it. But let's use technology to solve a problem that technology has exacerbated. Which means let's use these platforms to weave in. Um, how are we going to get our human contact today? You know, and this is this is the thing that Retribe is developing right now. Is this is the idea of this application that can keep track of people's human contact to make sure that people do have their little tribe that they can go get out to in their local community and use the local coffee shops, use the gyms, do the things that we know we should be doing, but we don't because of social anxiety and because I would. It's so much easier to order food and any other kind of things that I need on this. Sit, sit. You know, in Toronto. When I was in Toronto oh, three or four years ago, and you look at the downtown core in Toronto, I think 75, maybe even more percentage of all of the dwellings are single occupancy dwellings. Like where you're literally put in these like little kind of egg carton things stacked upon each other, you know, in these very isolating cold buildings that just keep you further and further away from the earth. You know, and just say here, order whatever you want on the every, and and we become physically unhealthy. We become spiritually ill. We become mentally befogged and depressed and with anxiety. Where again, we can look down onto the streets and go, oh, all those people out there having fun, but be crippled by social anxiety and fear. Like, oh, I'm not going to fit in down there. You know, and I think this is the thing, Eric, is that we again we become so disconnected from our true self, which is like we are human. You know, and this this was one of the ideas of that that I want to try to implement is this the idea of forgetting to remember. You know, forgetting all of this stuff to remember really who that we are like you know, children of the earth, and like these beautiful little spirits having these human experiences, and that we can kind of get rid of all of the stuff, and just know that we can hold our hands out, extend in help and the, 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 the reciprocity of receiving help and all of our problems go away. <laughs> you know, we're designed to receive help and to, to, to give help and everything else kind of falls by the wayside where, but we're so wrapped up in the thing of the I'm I, connection here. I don't know if oh, it's on your side or mine. I don't know. You, you're coming across fairly good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Last few things of what, from what you said, but, I got I got the the big picture. Like I can, yeah. I, I see where you're coming from with that, and I think that we we can both agree, you and I, but also Pete Pete from Genoa is doing a fantastic job in Toronto at the moment. You know, when when Pete started this thing, Genoa, people are like, what is that about now? Mm. Huh? The pandemic was a silver lining on its own. People are mm. like are craving for human interaction. I'm like yeah. yes. Show me where you can have some real connection. Yeah. Um, I think that's why we have to uh, be, we have to model. You know, we have to, uh, we have to show this new generation that, wait a minute, maybe you don't see it, mm. but this idea to be connected as you are on social media is creating this, um, this social trap. Yeah. This social trap that is loneliness, that is social isolation, and what so that eventually lead to depression. Mm. And, and it's a conundrum. Yeah. A living conundrum when we say, oh, I feel so connected, I have thousands of friends. Yeah, but when was the last time that you met any of them in person? Yeah. And again, I'm not there to judge anyone, I'm not there to label anyone, but if you look at millennials, how often we see them, they're all together, and yet they're scrolling down, yeah. and they're not related to each other's. Yeah. So we have to relearn how to connect. We have to start right from the get-go. Yeah. From the base. This is so I think this was the thing that you were asking me to do is to challenge you on this and say, where is there is there really a problem? Like are these young, you know, this next generation of people who are in their little groups on their phones doing their things, are they not actually learning uh, new skill sets or um, developing their brains in other ways where human evolution is perhaps meant to go down another path? 
Um, you know, so I'll, I'll challenge you. Is, is this going to be a problem? Or is it a problem? Or is it just humans natural ev evolution with our relationship with technology and AI and all that kind of stuff? <laughs> well, I'll say it this way. Um, it's an addiction by design. Mm -hmm. And the folks at Stanford University know that part very well. And the people who created the tech giants, as we know it as, uh, as much, uh, were just a guinea pig from this experience that began years ago. Okay? Mm -hmm. Without going into the details, I think that this new generation is the first to... Um, be completely uh, disconnected or completely off from uh, the the let's see the, the 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 heritage that we had from before. In other words, our generation is still able to remember how it used to be when we had access to analog tools. So, an example: if you were to say, if you were to say, I feel bored. There were ways to just throw a ball and go and play with the with the boys in the park. Remember, I've done that many for many years. Or uh, after school, we would go. We would rush out in the park. Never that we would stay at home doing what? Watching TV, boring. Reading books, not really. We were looking for something. So mm -hmm. the problem that we have with this new generation is that they're so convinced. And again, I say that in a very respectful way, please. They're so convinced that this machine possesses all of what you need to be happy, functional, um, smart even. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to put you to the test. I'm going to put you to the challenge. Put it aside for a while, as I just did, right? Seven days uh, for free. Put it aside for a while and watch, watch the transformation appearing in the way you think with your own head, in the way you feel with your own heart, your own guts, as we used to do in the Eastern part of the world, right? the way you see, the way you smell, you open your senses, you discover a new world, and you realize, as you were mentioning before with Ellie, that, oh man, uh, it's much more than what I thought it was. I mean, it's super smart, it's super nice, but it's very limited, right? Mm -hmm. And I see that, and let me just talk about my, uh, if I may, about my experience from the last seven days. Wow, what I found is this, after only a few, two days, okay, because the first two days I was like, oh, am I doing the right thing? Why am I doing that? Blah, blah, blah. But after two days, I was like, wow, now I feel relaxed. I don't feel the need to look at my phone every 10 minutes. My phone was off. That's the point. There's no FOMO when your phone is off. Um, I need to ask people around if I'm in a, a different place and I need to find my way around. Uh, if I feel bored, I need to use imagination and tools that are around me. <laughs> and and it, it was just like, wow. It's like, how come we have to wait for so much pain, uh, frustration, and human distress before we can recognize that, wait a minute, maybe, as we said just before, the solution is right there. So if we put aside what became the problem over the years, the solution will appear instantly, instantly. I, I agree with you completely. It isn't rocket science, <laughs> you know? I think it's just gonna take uh, a few people, a few kind of brave decisions to do exactly what you did with the seven day, uh, was it a phone, phone detox? Did you, is that what you call it? Yeah, so, so I did a phone, a seven, full seven day. Full, phone uh, free, phone choice. free. Yeah, yeah, phone free, just the phone. Uh, and now when they do another seven day with no technology at all, and mm -hmm. eventually I'm under discussion with a filmmaker to create a series around, around a six months, phone free, six months. And if not, yeah. one year. I really want to show the evidence that, yeah, you can still survive. You can still manage to have a happy and healthy lifestyle. You can still yeah. manage to have real human connections around you. Hello? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I want to prove the evidence and the one that are arguing with the fact, I'm like, okay, fine. Put it to the test yourself. Just do yeah. one hour. You know, some people in your circle, because you're in London, so just ask around. Go around yeah. and they can say, could you put your phone down in the middle of the week? Rush, 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 busy, busy, busy. 
Can you put, put it off for one hour? Like can they really, really in the middle of the afternoon? What do you decide? It will go crazy. It's like, yeah. what? You want me to put my phone down for one hour? You, you, uh, uh, the, the, the world will miss me. <laughs> you got it. The world will I, miss me. I think you've hit a real good, like good, good thing is that yes, what you did, you know, seven days or six months or one year, like those can be extreme versions of what you want to do as an experiment in terms of a human getting back in touch with their humanness. But really, you know, it, this ultimately is about giving people space to create healthier relationships with their devices, right? Um, cold turkey doesn't have to be forever and ever and ever. It could be an hour, could, like like how some people do meatless Mondays, you know? Just little bits of things where they're like, okay, I, I'm, I don't want to be a vegan, but I'm going to do my bit for the planet yeah. and for yeah. Earths and to reduce like, you know, the, all the meat consumption to just doing one day a week. And I think in that we are just, it's about forming healthier relationships with, with devices, but also people. So that in that one hour, maybe you're going to be spending time with somebody instead of having your phones across from each other on the table, dinging, 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 email, 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 you're actually having a human engagement with somebody. You have a human engagement. That's what's missing at the moment, like real human connections. So yeah. I have a, I created a program two years ago, the beginning of the lockdown. And I did it for a men's group, uh, the Mankind kind project, if I can name it. Yeah. And uh, the idea was just to encourage men to be uh, more mindful about their, their health condition at large and help them improve their well-being as well. Mm -hmm. So what I created was the Express the Excess. And it's simply a 21 days program in which everyone, not just men, but everyone is encouraged First thing in the morning when you wake up, okay? Instead of reaching out for your phone, you're encouraged to use this 21 minutes as a container of resources to improve your well-being. 21 uh, minutes for 21 days. And that itself is enough first for people to recognize that, wait a minute, it's kind of difficult. I was able to do maybe three days, but then after that, I switched back to my old habits. Mm. But also for people to recognize that, wow, if I can do that only 21 minutes a day, because you continue after if you choose to, then it means that I can take my control back. Mm -hmm. I'm not controlling more. I'm not con you know when you wake up in the morning and you go on your phone and you're like, I so much wish I have this uh, message back from the email mm -hmm. that I sent yesterday or series of photos that I posted on Instagram or blah, blah, blah. And you don't have the likes that you're looking for. Or someone sent you a message saying, oh, this is boring. Or you, you don't get what you want. It's yeah. going to screw up the rest of your day. Yeah. And if you do it uh, nonstop, repeatedly, eventually it's going to lead uh, you to a real depression. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So why don't we take 21 minutes in the morning just to say, okay, here I am. I'm present. You can have some positive, positive affirmations if you choose to. You can, uh, as, as I will talk a little bit after, uh, you can do like laughter yoga, because I also teach laughter yoga. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter really, it's up mm. to you. I always prefer to let people decide on their own. Yeah. What, if I give you 20 minutes back, 21 minutes yeah. back, what are you gonna do with that? Huh? Yeah. Because people sometimes don't even know. They're like, well, <laughs> All the answers that I got back from, from clients is often, and they don't really understand it in the first place, but it's related to what's on their phone because they have mm. no life. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't uh, emphasize enough that morning routine without your phone, how important it is to start the day in a, in a, in a, in yeah. a connective way, in a mindful way of some meditation, some beautiful thoughts. I think it's an absolutely wonderful thing. And Eric, we've actually, I, I told you these 45 minutes, man, they fly by. Oh, you so, fly by so quickly, yeah. <laughs> so they, we, we, we've, we've, we've run out of time now, but um, I'm, I'm sure that some people that would, would, would heard this will be interested in that 21 day challenge. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, uh, you can email me all of the links that you want and I'll put them in yep. the Facebook yep. feed. But just now, if anybody needs to get in touch with you, if they're interested in, in, um, in getting to, in touch with you to, to help advise them with regards to the relationship with their devices or their online the, the world, uh, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, you can, uh, they can email me and follow at digipass.com. Also look at my website, digipass.com, which will help them understand 
what I bring to the hotel world. We haven't talked about it during this program. Uh, and uh, furthermore, um, I do have my uh, patients Facebook, LinkedIn, for now yeah. at least, for now. And uh, yeah, happy to talk to whoever is ready to make uh, some changes in their life. And uh, I would just finish by saying, if you really want to find ways to get out of this addiction by design, you need to find the opposite. And that's why I created this one is by design, because yeah. the main idea was to counterbalance the side effect of it. That's, that's what you find in my program. And when people go on this uh, website, Express the Excess, they will uh, be able to understand how they can get it started. And of course, if they need help, I'll be there to support them. But the idea is really to, to make sure that you understand that when you say I'm off from this environment, there's something else waiting for you. And it's exactly. amazing. It's beautiful. I love what you do. On another note, too, I think that we will we'll have to get together in the next week or two, because I think I that uh, we, we, we need to start kind of looking at ways that we can offer, um, you know, a kind of a, a retribe retreat, uh, or maybe out in Portugal with with um, with some some of the men that I'm working with, because I think that uh, getting back to nature is needed for many people. So let's um, let's talk in about the that real too. world, Nick, in the real world. Yeah, beautiful. And you know, I just got back from Portugal a month or two. So there's yeah. something call, calling me to do some stuff out there too. So Eric, um, it's been an absolute pre pleasure, brother. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, let's amazing. get in touch in it. Let's amazing. get next, next week and stuff like that. And let's have another Zoom call. Thanks everybody for joining us. Please um, like a, uh, pay attention in the Facebook feed and I'll put Eric's links if you need to get in touch with them. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Eric. And uh, don't forget to join me on Thursday at 11 a.m. for another Tough Through Tender gathering where we're going to be start doing some little bit of changes where those gatherings are going to be um, just adjusted a bit. So that'll be interesting stuff to come. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. And thanks again, Eric. I'll talk to you later, buddy. Thank you, Nick. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.